All right, let's see. Uh, the top-rated question for today was uh, from Janine Ron, who said, how did America's greatest generation spawn its worst? That's a really excellent question, and I have a, an over sort of an uber theory about this. I wish I'd love to tell you this was mine, but, I mean, this is just a combination of a, things that a bunch of other people have said, at least regarding the greatest generation and a little bit of, uh, you know, improvisation on my part towards the end, because this one I gave a little bit of thought of. I've been thinking about it for about an hour since I... Um, shut down the questions. Um, it, it's a. If you think about it, it actually kind of makes a, f a fair amount of sense. Now, I'm just going to preface this once by saying that two things. First of all, we're speaking in generalities, so uh, to the degree that people say, "Well, I know somebody," well, I have no doubt about it. There's you know millions and millions and millions of exceptions to these rules. So, number one, I'm speaking in generalities, and number two. Um, when you talk about a generation, a generation is not a, a, like a clearly defined quantum unit. It's not a little packet. Uh, a generation is a, you know, when we talk about the greatest generation or the baby boomers, we're talking about a bell curve. And because we're talking about bell curves that overlap, there's a lot of gray in between these um, cohorts, in between these um, age group cohorts. So with that said, Again, there's no clear demarcation here, so I'm going to speak in generalities and so on, but I think this is an important question, and I think it has an answer. I really do. So uh, Janine says, how did America's greatest generation become its worst? The greatest generation, as we know, and I don't disagree with this at all, I completely agree with this, is that generation that was born in the, in the 1920s, grew up in the 30s, and uh, suffered through the Depression as a prelude for the great uh, formational uh, event of their life, which was World War II. Um, those of us who weren't alive during World War II, if you haven't really, really deeply looked into the age, at least if you if you study it historically, you get some sense of it in the same way that any outsider gets a sense of something. But um, but for those of you who were alive and who are members of the greatest generation, it, it's difficult for your descendants to fully appreciate, I think, just how much of that war, just how much that war occupied the brain space, how much how much that war occupied everything. Um, if you listen to the music of that time, if you listen to the commercials of that time, you listen to the radio shows and the golden age of radio, if you look at the posters and the billboards and, and everything, for those of us who weren't there, it's very difficult to understand how um, monomaniacal a, a culture could be. And I don't mean that in a bad way, how, how focused on one idea uh, America and the rest of the world was on World War II, on winning that war. So you ask yourself about the greatest generation, and the reason they're the greatest generation is they grew up with, uh, they grew up free, they grew up, in, were birthed in America that was probably at the height of its um, muscular power, certainly at the height of its industrial power. Um, we'd assimilated by, by the beginning of World War II, we'd assimilated a, a fairly significant number of immigrants that had come in at the turn of the century. And so you've got these people with this, with this solid American can-do attitude. Um, and then this catastrophe in the form of the Depression hits. And proud people, independent people, are forced to do things and see things that they don't ever want to see again. The only time I ever saw my dad cry was a member of the greatest generation. I ever saw him cry once in his life, and that was when he was talking about, and this was at the end of his life, when he was talking about um, watching his neighbors pick through garbage uh, during the Depression. Um, that's hard on people, and it's a much harder on people from that time period because people like us, uh, people of my generation and younger, don't have that sense of pride uh, that they had. Uh, and I'll try to cover a little bit about how we lost that uh, sense of pride. So you've got this generation forged by the Depression, and uh, America is extremely isolationist. You know, we, we're, we're settled from people who tried to get away from European wars, and the war in, in Germany had been going on for a year and a half before um, you know, we, I'm sure we met many Americans had an opinion on whose side they were on. There were millions and millions of Germans, Americans, who had an opinion on the other side before uh, the full atrocities of Hitler came out. And uh, and so you've got this country that's just kind of blindly staggering along and hoping nothing happens, and then along comes Pearl Harbor. And that sense of outrage and betrayal and, and indignation, I think, was just the release of a spring that had been coiled um, by the war in Europe and by watching the 30s and watching the growth of fascism in Italy and Germany and the rise of Japan, I think people knew uh, for years before Pearl Harbor that something was going to happen and that they were going to get involved one way or another. And I think Pearl Harbor was just the release of it. But we can't um, 
we can connect, I think I can connect to Pearl Harbor uh, a little bit because of 9-11. Just that sense of disbelief. And I suspect on some level, 9-11 was more emotionally gut-wrenching than Pearl Harbor because Pearl Harbor, you heard a report. You heard, uh, you know, Japs bomb Pearl Harbor and and newsflash. And then, uh, you know, hours later, a day later, you see a picture or two in the newspapers, a still picture of the Arizona blowing up or something. And this this outrage starts to sink in slowly. But I'll tell you what, on that morning of 9-11, when you see that jet fly into that tower, the second jet, there's nothing quite like that. I think it's probably the most shocking thing that the American people have ever had to see with their own eyes. It's just like, oh, my God. But in any event, for those of you that remember 9-11, that sense of, 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 of disbelief and, and, um, and incredulity uh, and outrage, yeah, well, outrage, but really, the incredulity comes first, right? I, I remember I turned on the TV just as I was in California, just after the first tower fell. Um, and I turned on the TV, and I saw a helicopter or something circling, taking a picture of the remaining tower. And um, I I just looked at that, and I remember thinking, isn't that funny? I could have sworn there were two World Trade Center towers. I guess I'm mistaken, because I... Because buildings just don't disappear. I remember thinking I was sure there were two of them. That's how that's how shocked I was. And so this whole um, this whole wave just hit the American people and a young, healthy, growing, tough uh, people. But as always, you know, our adversaries looked at the that greatest generation who went out and cleaned their clocks. But the reason World War II started was because the Germans and the Japanese figured uh, the democracies were weak and decadent, had plenty of reasons to believe that. The Roaring Twenties and uh, certainly the British were, were you know, led by people like Neville Chamberlain and um, uh, certainly not in any position to give any of these tyrants a sense that they were going to stand up and fight. So the greatest generation goes off to war. I need to get back on topic. How did America's greatest generation spawn its worst? So the greatest generation goes off to war. And... Um, and I don't think they went off to war with the kind of sort of innocence that they went off to World War One or the Civil War. I think I think there were enough of them that had been through World War One or whose fathers had been through World War One that they didn't think this was going to be like a rah rah. You know, I hope, boy, I sure hope there's some of them left by the time I get there. Um, and so you're struck, you're, you're locked in this titanic struggle. And those of us who look at the war from the tail end, looking backwards, forget how victorious the Japanese were. Uh, for the first six, seven, eight months of the war. They're unstoppable. Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, uh, you know, New Guinea, and everywhere. The Germans are rolling over Europe. Uh, You didn't enter this war thinking, hey, it's a slam dunk, we're going to win, it's just a matter of time. Um, It was, uh, you know, this is is bad. This is real bad. Um, Although, strangely enough, just as a parenthetical, they took a poll of Britons in... uh, Right in 1940, at the end of 1940 or early 41, at the at the darkest of their night, um, right after or right during the Battle of Britain, and I think only two percent of Britons thought that they were going to lose the war in their darkest days. They knew they were going to win it. Isn't that interesting? That's that spirit that comes from you know adversity. So they go off to war, the Greatest Generation, and they go ashore at Normandy and they go ashore at um, Iwo and all these other things, and you have large numbers of people who don't come home, about a million, I guess, and you have all these um, gold stars and windows, and you have uh, uh, everybody knows somebody who's died. Everybody knows somebody who's died, and most people know family members who've died, and many families have many family members who died, and uh, you don't forget that. And, And significant numbers of the population come home because, as I said, it was such an enormous mobilization. There's so many people in the military um, significant percentage of the population comes home with friends who either were killed or were killed in front of their eyes. People who got to be friends when they got into combat. Yeah, I was sitting there with my buddy Joe, and, and there's an artillery barrage, and I turn over, and his head's gone. You know, this kind of thing, and that has an effect on people that we can't connect to. And to get to the political issue of the greatest generation spawning the worst, I actually genuinely believe this. I I believe that the greatest generation came home with a form of uh, post-traumatic stress uh, stress disorder. And I think the case you can make for that is that once the greatest generation came home, if you look at what happened to the culture and what they wanted and what they got and what they deserved was absolute peace and quiet. I think dad came home from World War II. My dad, but other dads, all the dads, basically came home from World War II and had seen their friends get their 
head shot off and decided that from that point forward they just wanted to sit in a in a nice uh, recline, reclining lounge chair and not hear another loud noise or have another start or another uh, burst of excitement in their lives. And so you get Perry Como and you get Lawrence Welk and you get, um, and you get you know, Paint Your Wagon and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and, 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 and you get a very, very um, kind of a bland Intentionally bland. I think they. I really think they wanted it this way. An intentionally bland um, culture, uh, where which they deserved. And so you've got these guys come home and they don't want any more loudness or excitement or conflict. They don't want any more conflict. They don't want any more arguments. They don't want any more fighting. They've seen enough fighting. They want to come home. They want to relax. They've earned their relaxation. They saved the world. And so you you end up with this culture that's very bland and very conformist. And that's the '50s culture. Now, obviously the, the the kids who went on to become the hippies didn't just spring out of the earth as hippies. They were kids in the 50s. And with a culture that was so kind of, you know, almost tranquilized, like all generations, they wanted to rebel. But unlike their fathers or their older brothers, they didn't have a cause to rebel for. They had to almost rebel against the cause. We're seeing a lot of this now. I, I, when I um, posted this, uh, did two episodes ago, we did this um, uh Common Sense Resistance Special Edition, and I was looking for some um, uh, bombed-out uh, buildings, and I saw somebody put a little graphic, and I couldn't identify them. I would love to tell you I came up with this, but I didn't because it's brilliant. And I was talking about the popularity of things like the zombie movies and Walking Dead movies and that kind of thing and, you know, post-apocalyptic uh, stuff. And somebody had said, um, when, when the culture has eliminated all adventure, then the only adventure is to eliminate the culture. And I thought, man, that's exactly it. The reason the zombie movies are so popular these days is because it's a world of lawlessness in a world where there's so much law and so much regulation that, you know, you you automatically want something to rebel against. And I think that's what happened in the 50s. I think these kids that missed the war um, grew up and had nowhere to go and were and, and felt left out and, and felt under um, under attended by their parents. Uh, they, you know, the Korean War was not World War II. It was not this. Everybody pulled together. You know, wow, we're gonna we're gonna whip them. You know, the, it was a it was the first of a modern war. It was not a it was not an all out win it uh, war. It was a, a just this police action that just bled people out, and it didn't really have the support of the American population to the degree that World War II did. And you know, and, and all this stuff, they come home, they're really kind of disappointed. And I'll, I'll go further than this. I think the reason that the greatest generation spawned the worst generation is because they did not – I don't think the greatest generation – I think they were the greatest citizens, the greatest Americans, but I think they were terrible parents. As a general rule, as a general rule, I think they came back and had been through so much that they really thought that what they had to do was provide material uh, benefits – as long as they had a, you know, as long as they kept the, the refrigerator stocked and, and the electricity on and the house with a roof over their heads, I don't think that the parents of the of the war generation, the greatest generation, interacted with their children anything like as well as their own parents had interacted with them during the 20s and 30s. Anything like as well, uh, you know, America's after World War II. Now we're talking about the great gen greatest generation coming home. America looks around suddenly we're the we're the only we're the only economy in the world. We're not just the biggest. We're the only one. Uh, Britain has been bled white. Russia has been 20 million killed. And there was never an economy there anyway. Japan is in uh, ruins. Germany's in ruins. Europe is in, in ruins. These guys come back from World War II in the late 40s, early 50s, and they realize, my God, this w we are the world's economy. And so American business takes off, and this idea of the businessman and the idea of a guy who who's working this job, and he, and he comes home late, and he doesn't come home in time for dinner many times, or if he does, he's had a full day of work, he's had enough nonsense, he's been to the war, he doesn't want to hear it, he doesn't want to go out and play ball, he doesn't want to argue, he wants dinner on the table, and he wants, um, he wants, you know, wants to watch TV and, uh, and relax. And I'd be the last person to say they hadn't earned it, but certainly it was the case with my dad, who was a hotel manager, he really worked two jobs. He had his daytime job, he'd come home at 5 o'clock, take a nap, he'd go back home um, at 6.30, and... Uh, and do the second part of his job, which is entertain people at nighttime, which is great. But um, we we never um, we never spent we never got time with our with our fathers or 
and our mothers paid the price for that because they never got time with their with their husbands. And it, I, I think the whole generation with the I say this with the deepest respect. I think the whole generation had post traumatic stress disorder after what they did and what they achieved, and they came home and basically withdrew into a Lawrence Welk world in the den where they didn't have to connect. And how many how many members of the greatest generation do you know? I know my father was this way, and my dad got to Germany in the last week of the war. So he never got shot at, and he never had, he never was in combat. He certainly had friends who he lost. But how many World War II veterans do you know who never said a word about this their entire lives? How many, how many times do we hear these stories as more and more of them die off, where it turns out that this guy was awarded the Medal of Honor or something, and his wife had no idea, no idea. He never talked about it. You know, your husband was a, you know, was a was a, a silver star winner. He saved, you know, thirty guys' lives in the when he when he went over and took out a machine gun nest, in, you know, landing at Tarawa. The kids don't know. The wife doesn't know. That means that means that guy suffered with that kind of um, uh, trauma internally for his entire life after the war. Never shared it with anybody because it just wasn't done. It was it was seen as weakness. And I think um, I think that's why the greatest generation spawned the hippie generation because these kids came back to a very dull culture, a very bland and very you know white bread culture with nothing exciting about it, and they needed something to do. All kids rebel against their parents; they needed something to do, and they did not have that close emotional tie to their parents that that the greatest generation had to their parents. And so you start getting into things like the beat generation, this kind of low-level sort of rebellion, right? Like, hey, daddy-o, you know, or hey, man, you know, don't be such a square. This kind of talking back and brushing your hair on the street or combing your hair, I should say, on the street. This kind of beat thing is kind of this proto-hippie sort of, yeah, daddy-o, this kind of, you know, rebel without a cause kind of a rebellion, which looks like, you know, Mormonism today. And, um, and so by the time you get into the 60s, you've got this bifurcated kind of a generation, uh, You've got you've got the, the the early '60s, right up until about the '60s didn't start until '67, right? That's when the '60s started. The '60s didn't start. What we call the '60s really didn't start until '67, '68, Summer of Love, you know, that kind of thing. Because most of the first half of the '60s was, uh, you know, the, the kids of the '60s were crew cuts and Jack Kennedy and we're going to the moon and you know, great guys. And then all of a sudden, right around '67, '68. Something happened. Something matured. Something came of age, and um, and man alive, that went to went to the devil. I think if I'd been two years older, three years older, I probably would have been a hippie. Uh, I might have recovered from being a hippie, but I would have been one. But I was too young to be a hippie. Um, I didn't. I, I was a space age kid. I was a I was a product of the space age. Those were my formative years. I wasn't old enough to be cynical about things like, you know, nuclear-powered um, rockets or, or living under the ocean and harvesting, you know, magnesium pellets off the sea or moon colonies. I thought I, I thought this was going to happen, really going to happen. And so I always had an optimistic kind of a pro-America, steely-eyed missile man, hoorah kind of uh, attitude about things. But if I'd been a little bit older, I think that would have bounced off me the way it bounced off the hippies. And then when the drug thing came along, I would have been old enough to be into the counterculture. But fortunately, I was personally too young. And and as uh, J. Colger 2000 just points out, I don't know how I could have missed it, uh, you know, Vietnam, right? Once these guys start coming back from Vietnam and realizing that uh, I have nothing but undying respect for the Vietnam veterans, I respect them more than any of our veterans. But it, if you're going to send guys to war around on the other side of the planet, you better show them that you mean to win it and quickly. Because this business of sending... American soldiers in a police action that goes on for 11 years with no plan for victory and certainly no effort for victory, effort for casualties, effort for tactical wins, but no no sense that America's putting its full, its full force into the fight. Because we all know if America really went to war in Vietnam with everything we had, that war would have lasted several months. And so you have all this cynicism and all of this destruction of American ideals, and you've got this kind of, and uh, this kind of rotting sort of grass. It's like grass has been cut, just lying on the ground with nowhere to grow, and it's starting to fester. And um, so so you've got this, this gigantic rebellion called the 60s, and this is when the left 
politically inserted itself into the pop culture. They'd been trying to do it in the 20s with communism and 30s and the 40s and the 50s. But, you know, it was only when that disgust uh, about this classical America, this rebellion of the of the older baby boomers against their greatest generation parents and this rejection of everything that America stood for in terms of the pop culture and the left got in there. And instead of it just being about peace, love, and happiness, it also became about burning um, libraries and, uh, you know, and and um, all of that stuff with Tom Hayden and, and the Weathermen and all that junk. They injected this virus into the American bloodstream, and that virus lay dormant for a while, uh, lay dormant during the 70s and the 80s, because that virus was now producing new um, viruses that embedded themselves first in academia. So you started to get these very left-wing college professors, and they just raised a generation of left-wing students. And then they started to get into universities as professors. And the next thing you know, right around the time I got to college, 79, leftism started to be taught in every single uh, field of study. Um, My last semester at the University of Florida was 1981. And I had to take, I I literally had to take a class. It was one of those things where it's like, I'm I'm late registering and there's nothing left. There's nothing left, so I'll take feminism or something. And already I saw it there, but I'd already taken an anthropology class the year before where I was told that there's no biological difference between male and female and that, that, you know, this whole thing was cultural normative and, 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 you know, just this constant, constant sort of, and, and at the time it just seemed hilarious to me, just so counterintuitive and so obviously mistaken. Um, But... There it was. And so now how do you get from – because I don't think – I have to tell you, uh, we we baby boomers have a lot to be um, atoning for. But I don't think baby boomers are the the worst generation. I think the millennials are the worst generation. What I said at the beginning still holds. Everybody knows examples of of, uh, of people who aren't. I just came back from a large group of people where the millennials are as hardworking and gun-toting and awesome as anybody that this country's ever produced, but as a general rule, I think you basically, to answer your question, Janine, now that I've gone through all the mud of, you know, kind of laying it out, I think if the, the short form is the greatest generation was, was a generation forged in the hardship of the Depression, went out into the world, won the war, suffered post-traumatic dis- stress disorder that meant that they did not communicate emotionally with their children, which were the baby boomers. And so the baby boomers had great deal of material prosperity, but essentially no sense of emotional value, no sense of self-worth instilled in them by their parents because they didn't, the, the, the dads especially of that generation didn't want to make any emotional connections. The moms paid for it emotionally, and the kids ended up getting the best of everything except for a lot of love and attention. And And so now when we get to the millennials, the millennials are two generations down from the baby boomers. And what I see every day with the millennials is the millennials are the uh, children of of the baby boomers. And the baby boomers, I see this every day, the baby boomers not only... The baby boomers, watching, watching millennials grow up with their parents, I see the baby boomers and the Gen Xers consciously every single day i watch them interact with their children and i say what's going on here why won't they discipline this kid why why do they why won't they discipline this kid and i see it every single time the baby boomers will not be their parents they will not be their dads baby boomer dads will not be tough on their children because they don't want to be seen as this severe detached unemotional figure who doesn't do anything of this and get off my yard and get to work and you should be doing this and you should be doing that and why didn't you uh, do this and you know I, when I was your age and, and they just won't do it so what the so the mistake that the boomers made is that they they still wanted to give them the material benefits which they've lavished on the Millennials to a degree that the great that their fathers could never imagine so these baby boomer parents are lavishing this material wealth on kids and they're giving it to them instantly and they want to give it to them instantly because they don't ever want to be seen as bad guys. You know, they just don't. They don't want to be seen as bad guys. So um, there you go. Uh, yeah, hey, by the way, uh, Archilicus, uh, who just says this guy sounds ridiculous, take off, dude. Split. You don't have to be here. I'm not paying you to be here. Have it. Take a hike. Um, 
so uh, anyway, uh, this is basically what's happened. You had a, a greatest generation who was emotionally vacant and didn't connect emotionally with their kids. Those baby boomers figured out the only way they could help help their uh, parents is to um, is to give them. I'm sorry, just to help their kids, is to give them the material benefits and not be their severe fathers. So not only did the millennials not only get, uh, they just didn't get any discipline at all. And I see it every day. I see them out there interacting with them every day, and I don't I don't know what to do with it. I just do know that it's, uh, it's a sad thing to see, and I see it every day. I see them, um, I just see them, you know, I see, I see these, Boomer parents and Gen Xer parents giving everything to their kids instantly, all the time. And uh, how's it turning out for you? You know, these millennials are are are, are the most unfocused, the most uh, entitled generation. They actually, you can give them things on a silver platter and they won't pick it up. They don't, they don't, they don't know how to work. They don't, they don't know how to focus. They, they have no connection at all. I, I said at the beginning, speaking in generalities here, um, they don't know how, they don't know what work is. They don't, they don't know the connection. They don't know the connection between work and reward because the boomers that raised them and the, and the Gen Xers that raised them never want to be seen as, as disciplining their kids because all they got was discipline. They didn't get any love from their parents. Um, so um, that's basically it. And beyond that, I don't know what to say. It's just, it's just really how it goes. That's, that's how we got into this situation. And, um, and I don't know how we're going to get out of it. But I do know that, um, that I have a chance sometimes to interact with a, a nine-year-old. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't speak to him I don't, I don't, I don't give them the, hey, buddy, how's it going? That's what I hear from dads all the time out there with their, with their kids. You know, hey, buddy, hey, pal, hey, buddy, hey, pal. And you see it with moms too. You know, we're going to be best buddies and we're going to be friends and we're going to be, no, you can't be, you can't be your kid's friends or buddy. You got to be their parent. You got to do the hard things. You got to do the tough things. You got to, you got to say no. And there's very little no being said out there today. And I know they think they're doing those kids a favor, but they're not. And um, these millennials get out in the job market, and they um, they don't they don't know what to do. They 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 work for three or four weeks, and the next thing you know, um, they want a raise, and they want a car, and they want a promotion. And w- what makes you think you should? Well, I've been I've been coming to work for a month. Um, I know some of these kids personally, who I love very much. Some of these kids personally, I, know, I mean, these are people that are dear to me, and I'm still surprised at how. Um, remarkably disconnected they are at the idea that they should get something immediately and that if it's not given to them immediately they they have a complete emotional meltdown and they don't connect the fact that this costs money that that somebody has to lay that's the word somebody has to labor to present this to them it's just been given to them and it's been given to them by by boomers who are feeling guilty about not giving them things because they got so little from their parents emotionally in the first place got lots of material things we were spoiled off the face of the earth but um not a lot of guidance i think and i think when i watch uh, boomer parents and uh and gen xer parents with millennials i see the best of intentions and the worst of outcomes you know the best of intentions and the and just the worst of outcomes and i see these kids that just seem lost to me they don't know where to go they don't know what to do and i do know that uh, from limited experience i have that when you treat them uh as a as a parent rather than as a a buddy um it gets through they 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 that energy and that kind of rebelliousness just kind of deflates it's almost like that's what they're looking for and it is what they're looking for it's what all kids are looking for they're looking for boundaries they're looking for a sense that somebody's caring for them that somebody's concerned about them when you say to a kid um i don't want you going over there or you have to be back by seven or whatever what you're really saying to the kid when you say you have to be back by six o'clock is you're saying i care about you and if you're not home by then i'm going to start worrying about you and this business about oh no you know hey pal damon don't, don't worry about it that scares the daylights out of children and um, and that's uh, you know that's a short form I think Janine for for how it went. You had a, a generation who went out there, saved the world, came home utterly emotionally closed off, utterly uh, utterly damaged, and uh, led to a generation that wanted to make sure that they gave their children 
as much affection and, and attention as they felt that they missed. But in doing so, they didn't understand that you cannot just be nice. You can't you can't reason with fourteen. I'm sorry, with four year olds or fourteen year olds for that matter. You can't reason with little children and say, "Now, uh, you know, now, uh, Jordan, you know that um, that that you know having a temper tantrum in the store is just a form of attention." We've had a conversation about that. You know, we you, you no, you can't, they they don't know how to process it. You, they just don't have the neurons for it. They need to be given a click quick click of instructions like no and if they keep it up then they got to be made to feel it they got to they got to be punished for it and they got to be straightened out and that's how it works it's both right it's the carrot and the stick that's how you get healthy kids and i saw some of the healthy kids i've ever seen in my life in texas this weekend and i mean some of the healthiest kids i've ever seen ever and they got that perfect proportion of the carrot and the stick uh, they were told what they can do and what they can't do and there was no wiggle room about what they can't do but they were also shown all the time that they were loved every day and that's the that's the dilemma so um, anyway, that's uh, that's what I think it's all about, Janine. Hope that helped because um, I think it's really a big tragedy, and I think we're we're going to really pay for it, really pay for it. Um, so uh, anyway, um, I think that's really it. Excuse me for one just one second here.